What's going on guys? Super Savage uh, 789 here, bring you guys a video. And today we're doing what if Ericsson boarding school was in season one. This is a video that I've done a long time ago, but I had better ideas for it. And after speaking with Lytro, we decided to redo it on here. So without further ado, let's get into today's video. So for this to work, we're going to make a drastic change. We'll be swapping the locations of Ericsson boarding school with the motel from season one. This means that Glenn will be heading here to scout out the area for supplies, like he does to the motel. He climbs over the wall, but is immediately met by some kids, one of which is aiming a bow at him. Glenn raises his hands, trying to convey to the kids he doesn't mean them harm, but the situation is quickly stopped thanks to someone there. An adult comes over, telling the kids that it's okay. She walks over to the new man, introducing herself as Miss Martin. Her and Glenn get to conversing, where she reveals how all the adults left them to die. It's why they were so hostile towards him. He doesn't take any offense to this. He then explains how he was only there for supplies for his group back at the drugstore. Hearing where they are, Miss Martin tells Glenn that if they bring them some medical supplies, they'd be glad to trade them some food. They have a lot of young kids, so any of them could get ill. It's best they stock up. Glenn agrees to try and returns back to the drugstore to inform the group of these discoveries. After telling them the news, they agree that trading some supplies could be their best bet, further increasing the urgency to get into the medical room. Just like normal, the drugstore gets overrun with Carly or Doug dying and the group escaping. Now with nowhere else to go, Glenn decides to show them where the school is. They have some medicine but not much, maybe Miss Martin will be generous to them. They arrive at the school where they meet the woman in question. Upon learning about the group's situation, she decides to offer them to stay. They have plenty of room and they don't seem like bad people. Not to mention how they have kids with them as well, a struggle she understands all too well. The group agree and begin staying at Ericsson boarding school, all except for Glenn, who leaves like normal. The kids would all be very on edge with these new people staying with them. After all, the teachers abandon them. They aren't too trusting of new adults. Over time though, they begin to warm up to them. Duck and Clementine would begin playing with the kids and becoming their friends, which serves as the start of intertwining the groups. Things like Karcher helping with Rosie or Mark showing up with food would also help with this. It's clear right away that some kids have grown up a lot quicker in this new world. Marlon would be very mature for his age, which the group take note of. The group would also form bonds with the different kids. Lily would take care of Minerva, Sophie and Ten, with Minerva appreciating Lily's way of leadership. Larry would care about Mitch and Willie, Mark cares about Asim and Omar, etc etc. Arriving in the events of episode 2, the situation with the rigged bear trap still occurs, but Lee never acquired his fire axe since he never went to the motel. Instead, he'd be carrying a bow and arrow, having borrowed it from the kids. This means Mr. Parker dies no matter what, and Travis is shot. The injured person and Ben are then brought back to the school, where Miss Martin and Karcher begin trying to treat them to no avail. Ben would be very uncomfortable with this new group, surrounded by a lot of kids in a school. It reminds him of where he was when the apocalypse started, and it freaks him out. That's not to mention how teenagers typically don't get along with young kids that much. When the St. John's arrive, this situation is going to go a lot differently. Their offer of a trade is going to be much harder to push on the group due to the large quantity of people they have with them. They can maybe feed about 10 mouths, but not the entire school. The group also have to be less trusting with strangers due to protecting dozens of children. They also have a greenhouse that can be used to produce their own food down the line. So while the idea of more food is alluring, they ultimately decline the St. John's offer, saving the lives of both Larry and Mark in the process. The St. John's aren't going to let the school off easy though. There's so many people there, which to them equates to a buffet. They just don't have the manpower themselves to bring down the people there forcefully. Not by themselves anyway. Within a few weeks, they'd make contact with the raiders where they offer them a deal. Help to destroy the school and they can take whatever they want as a result. They only want the people. The raiders agree and so a plan is made. Due to them planning to bring down the school, they never force Ben into giving them supplies. After all, they're just going to take it anyway. At the start of episode 3, Lee, Kenny and Mark would all be going on the run to the drugstore like normal. Here the talk is rather positive. They talk about how Duck and Clementine have come out their shells a lot and have made friends. Mark also asks Lee about the other kids, asking his opinion on them. He can then say that Marlon is very mature, that Violet seems quiet, or that Lewis is funny. Kenny also mentions the St. John's, asking if they should have let them go. Could be dangerous for people to know about the school. Mark disagrees, saying how they should have taken the deal, with Lee taking sides or being on the fence. When the girl is bitten, Mark will tell Lee to put her out of her misery while Kenny says to leave her. It is Lee's choice though. They get to the drugstore and scavenge whatever they can before returning to the school. We see various people talking to the kids, which would be really nice to witness. Lily also isn't deranged since Larry is alive, so there's not much animosity there. 
She also doesn't send Lee to look for the missing drugs, since none are missing. If Carly is there, she would still tell Lee he should tell people about his past, which he can do if he wants. I doubt any of the kids beyond Clementine would be an option to tell. If you tell Mark, he probably wouldn't care. It's clear to him Lee isn't a bad guy, he shouldn't worry about his past mistakes. If you talk to Larry about it, Lee would instead tell him that he plans to tell people about his past since Larry already knows. The old man tells him that he thinks it's stupid. If they cast his ass out, don't come crying to him about it. If you tell Miss Martin, she wouldn't know what to think. They have a lot of kids here, so having a conflict with them could pose an issue. On the flip side, this is a school for troubled youth who have all done bad things. Maybe they could learn a thing or two from Lee. She doesn't have much to say, but she'd have a lot to think about. This piece wouldn't last long though. A few days later, the Raiders and St. John's all decide to attack. They show up to the school, throwing Molotovs at it to begin burning it down, which gets people to panic. They then move in to attack. As Lee, you go around the burning school where you begin saving people from the St. John's, the Raiders, the fire, and the inevitable walkers. Anyone who is saved will be loaded onto a school bus and prepares to escape. I don't know much about game design, so I'm just going to list everything that would happen. Both St. John's would survive during this attack. Larry would die trying to save some kids from the Raiders. All the unimportant kids die during this attack, meaning the main Ericsson group along with Sophie and Minerva are the only survivors. Rosie also manages to survive this. Since there's a lot of people to die, Doc wouldn't get bitten. Miss Martin would get bitten in the attack instead. Everyone then escapes on the school bus, upset over what happened. Not long after they hit the road, Miss Martin reveals her bite to the few remaining adults left. Kenny immediately says that she can't stay with them, which she would agree with. So they stop the school bus with Lee, Mark, Kenny, and Carly slash Doug taking Miss Martin outside. As Lee, you then get the choice to put her down or leave her. They then continue moving, where Lee can check up on people. Kenny and his family would obviously be somber, but they have better spirits than canonically due to Duck being okay. Lily would be mourning her father, so she isn't much for conversation at the minute. Ben also doesn't have much of note to say. Mark says that he doesn't think the bus will make it to the coast. They should find somewhere soon for all these kids. If you have Carly, she says that she knew having so many children with them would be a liability. And if you have Doug, he says he was never good with children. The gang would move along when they arrive at the train. Due to Lily's current state, she wouldn't decide to abandon the group due to her being in mourning as opposed to being vengeful. In this timeline, Larry's death also wasn't due to someone in the group, but due to outsiders, so she wouldn't have any reason to be bitter towards them. We would work together with Mark and Kenny, where they get the train working as well as meeting Chuck. The kids then all get on the train and head off. During this time, Chuck would say to the kids that they are all going to die, making people like Brody and Omar cry. Lee speaks to the old man, where he explains his point, prompting Lee to decide to train Clem. Seeing Lee do this, Mark would tell Lee that it isn't such a bad idea to teach some of the kids how to survive. He asks Lee who thinks is ready, with Lee getting to choose between Marlon, Lewis, or Viola. If you have Carly, she would also train someone. As for the rest of the kids, they still aren't mature enough, so they decide not to train for now. The train then arrives at the tanker, where a big change occurs. Since the group were at the school a bit longer than the motel and cannon, Krista and Omid wouldn't be here, having already left the area. So the group began working on getting the tanker down. After Lee retrieves a blowtorch, him and Carly slash Doug begin working on getting the tanker down. The herd comes in, and everyone begins moving with Carly or Doug getting injured getting on the train. This means that when they get to Savannah, due to the large number of people they have, the determinant character ends up getting killed by walkers. Chuck would also run away, leading the walkers from the kids just like his canon self, where he will meet his canonical demise. The group would arrive at the house still, where Clementine still gets him inside. Lee and Kenny would then go looking for a boat, with Kenny being less aggressive due to his family being there. They meet Molly, and Lee ends up in the sewers, meeting Vernon in the process. When returning, Lee finds out that Clem, Minerva, and Mitch are all missing, with no one else knowing where they've gone. Lily was too distraught, Kenny was looking after his family, and Mark was watching the rest, with Ben just being incompetent. They ultimately be found in the shed, where they find the boat. Due to the large size of the group, the plan to use it would be deemed impractical. They only have one boat, and a large group, and they don't plan to split up. Due to this, Molly has no reason to stick around with our group, and simply leaves. Lily and Vernon would both agree that heading to Crawford and taking to supplies would benefit both of their groups, so the team of Lee, Vernon, Kenny, Lily, Bree, and Ben would be chosen upon to take up this task. Both Karcher and Mark decide to stay behind in order to take care of the other kids. As in the game, Clementine can come along if Lee chooses to. Marlon slash Violet slash Lewis can also come along, depending on dialogue options. The group splits into three, when inside with the goal of getting basic supplies, medicine, and a way out. It does still lead to Ben letting the walkers in and Bree's death, but Ben wouldn't have anything to confess about here since he never made the deal. When heading up the clock tower, Lily would be trailing behind everyone. So when Ben gets grabbed, due to her state, she would just leave him to die. 
The group all call her out about it afterward, with Lee either shouting at her or taking her side. With Savannah's threat of imminent walkers, the group decide to rest for the night at the house and leave in the morning, which disheartens Clem. Vernon would take Lee aside and offers to take some of the kids. They can keep them safe. Lee can either agree or refuse, but either way, Mark overhears the conversation and would support the idea. So Vernon would take Sophie, Minerva, and Ten back to his group. You'd also want to take Willie, but Mitch refuses to depart from him, threatening the old man, which gets him to back off. The next morning, Clementine would still go missing, leading to Lee looking for her and getting bit. Since Vernon left with some kids already, the group doesn't think it was him here. Instead, Lee thinks that Clementine went to the Marsh House to look for her parents. He needs to head there. With walkers flooding the street, a plan is made for Lee to ring the bells along with one other person. If you have sided primarily with Kenny or Lily, then they will go with you. However, if you are mainly on the fence, it will be Mark. Whoever goes with Lee ends up ringing the bells, allowing Lee an opening to make it to the Marsh House where he meets the stranger. The man explains how some bandits robbed and murdered his family while he was looking for food. After that, he stumbled upon the school and took a liking to Clem, so he'll be taking her and starting a new family. A fight ensues and the stranger dies like normal. Since Lee got to the Marsh House quicker, he'd be able to get Clementine back to the house the group are held up in. Unfortunately though, the walkers would be following them. This means that when they return, the walkers will begin invading the house. Everyone heads upstairs into the attic as they keep the walkers back long enough to save everyone. By the time they all make it, Lee's time would be up. He slumps up against the wall and begins saying his goodbyes to everyone. As Lee, you can choose Lily or Kenny to shoot you. If you stay silent, the group will just leave you. The game then transitions over to Clem's POV as the threat of the walkers still needs to be dealt with. Before Lee passed on, he revealed his theory about walker guts to the group. With no other option, they drag a few walkers up to them and gut them, covering everyone in entrails. Since Rosie is a dog, they know they won't be able to hide her, so they decide to leave her in the attic with the promise to the kids that they'll return for her. Though with how dire the situation is, this is likely a lie from the adults. The group would then all enter the house and slowly begin moving towards the herd. While all the kids are scared, Brody would be the most terrified with her sobbing as they move. Karcher tries to calm her down, which leads to the walkers immediately pouncing on her. Doc would begin screaming, seeing his mother get devoured, leading to the walkers also grabbing him. The group would begin rushing out the house, fighting the remaining few walkers in the path. Kenny wouldn't be following them though, enraged by his family's death. He'd be killing walkers as a group are forced to leave him. When the group get outside the city, they'd hear barking as Rosie arrives, having found them. Unfortunately, there's no signs of Kenny. Now it's left up to Lily and Mark to protect this group of kids. This is where you'd assume season 1 would end, but that's not the case, as we have 400 days to discuss. There would be little things, like how Russell would potentially see Miss Martin's body. Vernon also never steals the boat, and would be in Rebecca and Shell's episode, along with Sophie, Minerva, and Ten. It wouldn't really impact it all too much, though. The big change is that we'd have a new episode, following Krista and Omid. The duo have been on their own the entire time, and have been struggling to get by. Krista's pregnancy has them both worried, with Omid suggesting they find a group for safety. She's rather reluctant, though. Whilst out hunting, the duo encountered two brothers. Krista immediately holds her rifle towards them with them defusing the situation. They introduce themselves as Danny and Andy, and after some conversation, they invite the duo back to their farm. Omid urges Krista that they need to do this. You can choose to agree or not, but either way, Omid forces them both to go. After meeting Brenda, the duo would look around, which eases Krista a bit. During this time, the duo get attacked with an arrow hitting Omid in the shoulder. Krista fights off the bandit, making them retreat as Andy and Danny run over to see what's happening. They apologize for the situation and explain how these bandits have been an issue in the area. From what they gather, they attacked a nearby school and took heavy losses, so the remaining few are very hostile. Omid would get taken upstairs to be taken care of as Krista is allowed to rest. Something about the situation doesn't feel right though. She can either demand to see Omid or simply sneak up there, but either way she heads upstairs to see Omid legless only to get knocked out. When she awakens, she'd be alone in the meat locker. She'd wait for Andy to come in the next day to deal with her. He reveals that Omi died last night, but don't worry, he tasted very good. As he goes to grab Krista, a fight ensues where she'd overpower him. She can either kill him or incapacitate him, taking his weapon and heading out to deal with the others. She'd fight with both Brenda and Andy, choosing to kill them or not. She leaves the farm and heads off alone, now a changed woman. When Tavia meets the 400 days group, Krista would no longer be pregnant. Regardless on the episode, Krista is going to refuse to join Howes. She barely trusts these people. The last time a group gave her an offer too good to be true it was. So Tavia takes a certain amount of people and leaves, which ends off season 1. But guys, that's where I'm going to leave it here. Make sure you like and subscribe and comment down below what you think is happening in the next episode. Season 1 was fun to write. I thought it'd be kind of a struggle, but the kids being more of a 
issue for the adults to deal with as opposed to actual characters was an interesting concept and it will obviously evolve into them being more important as they get older. It was also really cool to write a 400 days episode with Krista and the St. John's as there'd be some loose threads and it's nice that we could tie it up and it also sets up future things. Whoa. If you like what we do on this channel, consider becoming a member as it supports us and lets us know you want to see more content like this. For only $2.99 a month, you get access to early videos, exclusive community tabs, and your name read out at the end of videos, just like these people here. Big thank you to Kyla Fiend, Ellie Deplug2, Wax and Parrot Fish, Paul Keen, Funk Locks, Hazy Brush, Hayden Banks, Scintillating Susie, Roderick Hare, Marco DeCinco, Raven, and Crayman. And uh, yeah. Bye.